good morning to, to all of you. Welcome to the second and final day of our National Security Law Conference. And um, this morning's uh, panel, um, we have um, a panel of uh, unparalleled uh, experience with Hong Kong. Um, uh, we have uh, Professor Fu Hua Ling, uh, Dean of the Faculty here, been here for many years, um, uh, Professor Simon Young, um, also uh, um, has been here for, well, he'll tell you how many years yeah, he chooses this to you. Um, uh, Professor Carol Peterson yeah, has a long association with, uh, with uh, uh, Hong Kong University and especially with um, the uh, center for, uh, which is um, uh, hosting this conference, the, the, the uh, CCPL. Um, uh, and she has, um, well, thankfully, uh, kept, kept very much uh, abreast of what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, uh, we have uh, Professor Chai from uh, from Macau, yeah. um, and um, he he is um, an ex well from his from his CV, he's an expert in Jeremy Bentham, yeah. and uh, but according to to, to Hua Ling, he's an expert in everything. <laughs> well, that's the the, the uh, uh, that's the miracle of theorists, yeah. They can be experts in everything. Um, so uh, welcome, uh, Professor Chai. And uh, our discussant for today really needs no introduction. Uh, uh, Professor Albert Chen, um, uh, there he is waving at you. And um, I think he is probably the most uh, senior member of the faculty at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's, uh, and of course, uh, Professor Chen was, uh, was uh, dean of the faculty uh, 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 some years back. Um, so, um, uh, we'll follow the, the same format as we did yesterday. Um, uh, each paper will have, have uh, 20 minutes and, and then we'll, that will be followed by um, a response uh, from the discussant, uh, Professor Chen, and then we will have the Q&A, right? So um, the first uh, paper yeah, uh, is, is jointly written by uh, Professor Fu and Professor Chai, but uh, I am told that uh, Professor Chai will be doing the presentation yeah. So, uh, Professor Chai, when you are ready, uh, the, the floor or the screen yeah, is yours. Okay. Uh, sorry. Can you see the yeah. yes. PPT slide? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, of course, thank Hong Kong U for this wonderful uh, conference. Uh, the title, uh, of our presentation is the return uh, of high policing in Hong Kong. Um, sorry. Uh, this is slide slide two. Uh, our chapter looks at uh, the NSL through the lens of high policing. Uh, we discuss oh. three issues. Uh, the circumstances leading to the return of the high policing in Hong Kong, and second, the major features of the high uh, policing that the NSL has created in Hong Kong. Uh, third, a possible equilibrium between Chinese high policing and Hong Kong's liberal rule of law. Uh, this is a structure of, of our paper. Uh, A high policing, also called political policing or a national security policing, uh, it had disappeared from Hong Kong in the late 1990s uh, when the old special branch of the police was abolished uh, in 1997. To fill the gap, uh, Beijing imposed Hong Kong uh, the Article 23 duty of enacting a national security law on its own. Uh, Beijing's demand for a national security law in Hong Kong and the latter's reluctance to deliver it uh, had a long and tortured uh, history, which most of you know very well. I will not go into the detail. Uh, looking back, uh, I think we, we can say that uh, the longer uh, Hong Kong's delay uh, was uh, in enacting a national security law, the less uh, the central people's government's trust in Hong Kong uh, became. 
uh, the harder it was for the uh, national security matters to be left alone to Hong Kong. We summarize, uh, uh, we, we summarize the factors leading to the NSL uh, as the following uh, six uh, circumstances. Uh, first, the radicalization of street politics ranging from uh, protests, uh, civil disobedience, and disorder to violent riots. Uh, second, the rise of localism and its uh, mutation into uh, independence movement. Third, uh, the popular, I mean, domestically, the popular and international uh, sympathy and support for the above two uh, factors. Fourth, uh, China's rise facing a hostile international uh, community. Fifth, uh, Hong Kong government's indifference to and incompetence to tackle national security uh, threats. Sixth, uh, the central government repeated warnings uh, against crossing its bottom lines, but all to no avail. As a result of this, uh, these circumstances, Hong Kong in the eyes of a uh, central people's government had turned from an asset to a liability. Even, I mean, in the eyes you know, of, 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 of the central government, even a subversive basis to destabilize China. This is the background uh, against which uh, the NSL uh, was made. Uh, the NSL has made national security in Hong Kong the heart, I mean, the top priority of the central, the central governance of the uh, Special ad administrative region with the NSL, high policing has returned to Hong Kong. We uh, highlight uh, uh, we highlight uh, uh, three features of the high policing that the NSL uh, has introduced. Uh, first, uh, it is political. Uh, political crimes uh, are committed out of political convictions or ideologies uh, seeking to overthrow the state its government and uh, uh, its regime. Activities or crimes in danger national security are typical uh, political offenses. Uh, I quote uh, uh, the notorious uh, Carl Schmitt. Uh, the specific political distinction is that between friend and enemy, the end of a quote. The perpetrators of national security crimes are therefore considered by the state as enemy. So uh, the NSL is an enemy criminal law. The implication of the concept of enemy criminal law lies in at least uh, two aspects. First, the reduced or minimized protection of the rights of uh, enemy offenders. According to article, articles four and five, uh, the British, and the sweetest provisions of the ASL for, for us lawyers, uh, the high policing in Hong Kong must respect international standards of human rights under the rule of law. However, the protection of national security offenders is obviously weaker and lower than that of ordinary uh, offenders. And the examples are for example, uh, yeah, at 14.1, at 41 on secret, secret trial, uh, at 40, article uh, 42 on um, no bail or the presumption against bail, uh, article 46 on trial without a jury, uh, yeah, article uh, 43, um, the, the provision, I mean, six, uh, interception of uh, communications and covert surveillance. Second, the politification of the NSL. Uh, by politification, we, I mean, following the German uh, uh, criminal lawyer, uh, Jack Roberts, uh, we mean the shift of a court-centered system to a police-centered uh, centered one. The NSL has shown early signs of politification. The police now determines what constitutes subversion, secession, et cetera, by making arrests, and laying charges following its own interpretation of the law, the denying of or the presumption against bail leads to lengthy pretrial uh, 
detention, all this uh, turn the police process into uh, punishment. I, I believe Professor Sam Yang will have more to say on this uh, issue. Uh, second, it's, uh, it's pre preventative. High policing is principally absorbent policing aiming at intelligence gathering uh, as uh, illustrated by, yeah, I mean, so many, yeah, so many articles. The goal is decisively preventative, uh, preventive of risks. The method is, is, is covered, uh, uh, involving uh, secrecy and uh, deceit. Uh, as shown by, uh, yeah, <laughs> one, three, five, uh, eight, uh, nine, and 42, these articles, the NSL repeats again and again that uh, effectively preventing or stopping our national security offenses is its primary aim, prioritized over punishing them. The answer is we have at least three results. First, uh, the net is necessarily cast wide. High policing will be willfully blind to the differentiation between legitimate or lawful dissent and unlawful activities of endanger, endangering uh, national security. In Hong Kong, uh, initial evidence shows that uh, the so-called pro-democracy camp uh, has become the uh, main uh, target. A second, uh, reduced uh, accountability. I mean, to be effective in preventive work, proactive and aggressive intervention is a principal modus operandi, operandi of high policing. National security agencies often operate in secrecy and enjoy uh, privileges. To the degree that uh, uh, they are made accountable, their accountability differ significantly uh, from that of the regular police. For example, according to the NSL, uh, the work of uh, the committee uh, safeguarding national security, I mean, the bearer of the uh, primary national security respons responsibility shall be interfered with by no one. Information relating to its work shall not be subject to disclosure. Its decisions shall not be amenable to judicial review. Third, the fusion of intelligence gathering and criminal investigation. To avoid, uh, to avoid an excessive concentration of power, to avoid mutual uh, contamination and uh, interference, there was uh, in uh, rural law countries often a clear functional and organizational separation between high policing focused on intelligence gathering and the preemption and the regular law enforcement. Uh, contrary to this arrangement, uh, the uh, Department uh, uh, Safeguarding National Security of the Hong Kong Police and uh, the Office, uh, the Central People's Government's Office of uh, Safeguarding National uh, 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 Security, both have combined uh, the power of intelligence gathering and that of uh, uh, criminal uh, investigation. Third, it is controlled by the central. I mean, some colleagues have discussed this issue uh, yesterday. Uh, before the national security law, there was a significant uh, institutional autonomy for policing, including high policing uh, on the uh, Hong Kong side uh, to the effect uh, that uh, central ministries, either the Ministry of Public Security or the Ministry uh, of National Security was regarded as peer institutions to cooperate uh, the NSL has brought about a radical structural modification to this institutional, institutional autonomy. First, uh, the Hong Kong national security app apparatus is under the direct control of the central people's government. Uh, A, now I mean, assuming the primary responsibility for national security in Hong Kong, the committee, uh, Guard national security has a secretariat and its uh, secretary general is to be directly appointed by the uh, central people's government upon nomination by the chief, elect, uh, chief executive. 
and Article 15, a national security advisor is appointed by the central people of the government uh, to give advice uh, to the committee safeguarding national security. And significantly, to attend the meetings of the committee safeguarding national security. This key provision creates a legal mechanism whereby the central people government for the first time since the Honduras has direct access to the internal decision-making process of the Hong Kong uh, SAR, uh, the Hong Kong SAR government. I mean, furthermore, Article 12 provides that uh, the Committee of National Security is supervised and can be held to account by the central people's government. Article 53 expressly authorizes the central people's government's you know, office uh, uh, safeguard national security uh, to oversee and provide guidance to national security matters in Hong Kong. Uh, B, uh, the department safeguard national security, that is, I mean, the new special uh, uh, branch of, uh, of, the, of the police. I mean, the chief executive is required to consult uh, Central People Government's Office of, of, of Safety Guarding National uh, 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 Security before appointing the head of, 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 the, yeah, of uh, the Department of Safety Guarding National Security. Uh, Article 15 creates a possibility that uh, the Department of uh, Safety Guarding National Security of the Hong Kong Police could be staffed by professionals and technicians from outside of Hong Kong. Uh, opening a door to mainland officers to occupy important posts in it. Uh, a second, the Office of uh, Safety Guarding National Security, uh, an agency I'm belonging to the central people of the government has officially crossed the border and stationed uh, permanently in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong protested forcefully against the arrival of a few dozens of mainland immigration officers under the co-location scheme in 2018, and it fought fiercely against the extradition of serious fugitive offenders to the mainland in 2019. But in 2020, it had to embrace a gigantic national security officer, office of the central people's government in Hong Kong. Uh, according to Article 55, uh, the office, uh, this office, I'm Chief Guard National Security, is given jurisdiction over some national security cases. Once triggered, a case will be taken out of Hong Kong and placed within the mainland jurisdictions and the national uh, uh, procedural and uh, substantive laws uh, kick in. Thus, the two systems ends and one country uh, takes over. The irony is that there was a political offense exception in the aborted extradition bill to limit the extradition arrangement to ordinary offenses. But this bill had triggered the violent, violent protests in 2019 and finally led to the enacting of the national security law. Article 55, however, reverse, reverses the aborted bill by creating an entirely free corridor for political offenses to be transferred to the mainland jurisdictions while leaving ordinary of crimes intact in Hong Kong. Uh, with these uh, arrangements, uh, formal partners, I mean, the, the Ministry of uh, Public Security and uh, the Ministry of National Security, uh, are yeah, formal partners to, to, to cooperate with are, are equal footing, now have become supervisors of Hong Kong police, uh, with, uh, and both uh, de facto and a de jure on, on national security matters. Horizontal relations have turned vertical. National security policing is now shared uh, in form uh, between the central and the, uh, Hong, uh, and the Hong Kong and Hong Kong. Uh, and the part that belonging to Hong Kong uh, will, be carried out, will be carried out, in fact, under the watchful eyes and the direct guidance and uh, supervision of the uh, central people government. So then, uh, will the NSL bring Hong Kong's high policing into a converging course with that uh, on mainland? Well, we will not go into the detail of Chinese high policing. Uh, we will just characterize it as uh, 
total policing, uh, under which I mean, you are policed by everyone and everywhere, uh, your government, your colleagues, your WeChat friends, your students, and even your family, uh, family members. The NSL has certainly brought Hong Kong nearer China's uh, constitutional order and, uh, and, uh, and the national security uh, uh, regime. First, I'm together with uh, the NPCSC's decision on a, on a joint check, checkpoint for the high-speed rail link, uh, the national security law, has made it clear that the, that the NPC and its standing committee is capable of legislating on Hong Kong matters. Basic law had not created a self-contained system. Second, Hong Kong has still to fulfill its Article uh, 22 duty, but now, I mean, the gravitas of national security in Hong Kong has shifted from Hong Kong to Beijing. Third, the NSL shall prevail where provisions of Hong Kong local laws are inconsistent with it. Fourth, made and to be interpreted by the NPCSC, the ASL is a member of Chinese legal system. Uh, courts uh, could be expected to treat the ASL, I and mean, could be expected uh, uh, to treat the ASL as a Chinese law and defer to Chinese legal uh, doctrines, uh, concepts, principles, or I mean the methodology of, of, of interpretation. However, an alternative reading is still possible um, for the following reasons. First, clearly, China continues to insist on one country, two systems. She doesn't intend to turn Hong Kong into just another Chinese city. Second, by being added to Annex 3 of the basic law and promulgated by the chief executive and to be enforced in, the, uh, in Hong Kong's legal context, the ASL is also a member of and embedded in Hong Kong the legal system could be treated as part of Hong Kong law in the same way as the basic law has been. Uh, this is allegedly the legislative intention of the uh, ASL. Uh, in spite of you know, the radical changes it brings to Hong Kong, the ASL as a whole and articles four and five in particular set Hong Kong's national security regime decisively. You know, decisive, yeah, apart from uh, that on the mainland. Third, besides and more significantly, higher policing here in Hong Kong operates in a different political context and social, um, social milieu, which, I mean, overall is, is liberal minded and uh, uh, taking rights and freedoms uh, seriously. So the NSL may appear to be a meeting moment in which decisionalism may have prevailed over human rights under the rule of law. But in reality, the pre-existing liberal order in Hong Kong can still be expected to tame, at least moderate, the Leviathan and prevent Hong Kong's high policing from becoming total and uh, pervasive. Finally, the conclusion, uh, sorry, <laughs> I, I, I forgot to, yeah. The, SL, the NSL is here to stay. The special branch has returned and the Chinese high policing has obtained a foothold in Hong Kong. The NSL has carved out a national security space from the basic law regime, which I mean, uh, before uh, might be thought uh, as a self-contained seamless. As the NSL has introduced uh, enemy criminal law into Hong Kong, it has removed any barriers to uh, cross-border or cooperation regarding national security issues. The high briefing of the NSL itself in the text has the potential to penetrate to every fabric, considering Article uh, 9 or 8, yeah, has the potential to penetrate to, to every fabric of the Hong Kong society. Nevertheless, the NSL does not intend to fully integrate Hong Kong into, Chinese, uh, into the Chinese national security regime and a complete convergence is not on the CPG's uh, agenda. As the NSL itself has made it clear, the national security policing in Hong Kong is subject to the control of the ICCPR jurisprudence and the internationally practiced principles of the rule of law. Hong Kong, the pre existing laws, institutions, and social conditions will prevent any easy transplanting to Hong Kong of the Chinese total high policing 
uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I look forward to comments uh, and the questions. Um, uh, just a reminder that um, uh, if you have any questions here, uh, uh, please enter them into the, the Zoom part Q and A, yeah? and we'll we will take all the questions uh, at the end uh, after the three uh, uh, presentations here. Yeah? Now to continue with the the, the theme of uh, um, policing, yeah? uh, Professor Simon Young. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I don't need to tell uh, the people here how significant these powers are under the NSL. Um, uh, we've seen already uh, how um, uh, freezing uh, assets uh, can uh, basically dissolve uh, a media organization. Uh, so uh, I think that's just a, a reminder of how important it is for us to look closely at these uh, new uh, and old uh, police powers. So my paper essentially revolves around uh, three questions. Um, I ask uh, how are the duties and functions of police uh, extended? Um, how are the police powers widened? Uh, and importantly, uh, how are the me accountability mechanisms uh, changed? Uh, the first two questions, of course, are related because uh, if the functions are widened, then powers you know, have to relate to those functions. Uh, in this presentation, I'm only going to focus on the, uh, the new Hong Kong department, uh, which I, I noticed recently on the Hong Kong Police Force website, they refer, it's referred to as the NS department. So I'll use that same terminology. In my paper, I also talk about the, uh, the mainland office and how it has police powers in Hong Kong now, but I, I won't deal with that today in this presentation. I'll save that for the chapter. Uh, turning to the first uh, question, and I'll deal with it briefly because Xiaobo has already uh, done a, uh, uh, emphasized this quite clearly uh, in his uh, uh, presentation in the, in the joint paper with uh, Dean Fu. Um, uh, if you look at what I, what I will contribute is that when you look at Article 17, it's quite clear that the functions are now wider, uh, that you see reference to intelligence gathering, uh, you see reference to uh, coordinating uh, operations for the national security, national security reviews. It's clearly the functions of a spy agency, right? Uh, it's, the, it's the special branch that has come back. I agree entirely with Shelbo on that. Um, and in fact, uh, if you look at one of the uh, functions that is listed in uh, Article 17, it actually talks about executing orders or, or tasks that, that are assigned to this new department by the committee. Right? And I make the point here that they're more likely to be executing political orders because that committee, of course, is, uh, its membership is, of course, chaired by the chief executive, but also many of the principal officials are there and, of course, the mainland advisor. Not, not your usual police uh, uh, organization or tasks. Um, uh, so uh, it's a kind of a different beast, although it still comes under the Hong Kong police force, which is interesting. They didn't require that there be created a new, entirely new uh, law enforcement agency. Uh, let me now uh, move to uh, police powers. And I think to really understand uh, uh, this topic, one has to sort of come to grips with uh, the relationship of three instruments. Uh, article 43, which is neatly sort of puts all the police powers in one article. Um, and then you have uh, the implementation rules, not so neat, it's about more than 100 pages, which came into operation uh, after uh, about seven days after the promulgation of the NSL. Uh, and uh, it's very detailed. Uh, but it's familiar to, I think, uh, uh, Hong Kong lawyers' uh, eyes because it is modeled on existing legislation. Um, and then the third instrument, of course, are the operating principles and guidelines, which only relate to interception or uh, covert surveillance. But they have significance uh, more generally, I think, because of uh, what they say in terms of duties of, of the police and also accountability. And I'll, I'll say more about that later. 
But the first point I want to say uh, in terms of uh, my understanding of these three instruments and their relationship is that it's not like the common law um, uh, um, uh, conferral of police powers through uh, delegated legislation. Right? So when one sees the uh, implementation rules, you're, uh, for the, in common law eyes, your first reaction may be, oh, this looks a lot like subsidiary legislation. And it's very detailed. It looks like all the police powers are actually in the subsidiary legislation. Authority has been delegated to the chief executive uh, to create these police powers. But I think that's not the right way of looking at it. In fact, I think the powers are actually in Article 43 itself. itself. Uh, and uh, the implementation rules are kind of a fleshing out of uh, how, do, how those powers are to be exercised. Uh, and then the guidelines are just guidelines. Uh, as to how they should be exercised. Um, now, uh, there's one important difference uh, here um, from in terms of thinking about the rules as mere guidelines. That might, that might then be your other instinct. I think they're more than that, because I think that um, without the implementation rules, Article 43 cannot be applied, right? Because Article 43 says very clearly, you have to have the implementation rules to apply uh, uh, those powers. And in fact, I would uh, supplement that by referring to the, the law and legislation where Article 6 says that laws have to be uh, clear uh, and targeted and enforceable. Um, and uh, if you're only, if you're, given that we're dealing with police powers here, if you only have uh, those bare statements of powers uh, in Article 43, it would not be enough to enforce them. So they have to go together with the implementation rules. Guidelines, of course, are not law, uh, but it does say very clearly that officers have a duty to follow them and their implications if they don't. And I'll talk about that when I come to accountability. Um, so let's look co more closely at Article 43. Here's the text of Article 43. And if you ask, uh, well, what are the, the powers given to this uh, new department? Uh, I can give you an easy answer. Well, they're given all powers. <laughs> all powers under existing law. That's what I think the first paragraph says. In fact, there are two categories of police powers. Uh, and the clear intent here with the first uh, category is it says that uh, the NS department uh, should have uh, the measures that law enforcement authorities, including the Hong Kong police, and that's interesting because it seems to contemplate that other law enforcement agencies uh, powers should also go to the NS department. Um, at which they can apply under the laws in force, so existing laws, for investigating serious crime. There's a question then about what, what does serious crime mean? What is there a, what's the special category of serious crime and uh, the powers that are attendant to those crimes? Those are now automatically conferred onto the NS department. Um, and, and so the clear intent is you know, whatever powers that law enforcement agencies have in Hong Kong, and just, just uh, for those unfamiliar, uh, Hong Kong has several law enforcement agencies. In, in addition to the police, we've got the anti-corruption uh, body, we've got customs, we've got immigration, we've got uh, correctional services. These are all regarded as uh, uh, law enforcement uh, bodies with powers uh, and, uh, and duties to investigate crime. So um, it seems to sweep all that into the NS department. I question whether the ICAC powers uh, are swept to the NS department. Partly because, for, number one, the commissioner of ICAC is not a member of the committee. I don't know if people notice that, uh, whereas customs uh, and police uh, uh, are. Um, and, um, uh, that, and also, of course, the basic law has a special provision for the anti-corruption body, uh, conferring it with uh, operational independence, um, functional independence. So it may be that there's a special uh, there's an argument that can be made that ICAC powers don't get swept into the IC, uh, NS department. But let me turn now to the enumerated powers. So we have the seven uh, uh, paragraphs or clauses, which uh, say that in addition to existing powers, they also have these powers. Now, these uh, seven clauses overlap with many uh, existing powers, which the police may or may not have uh, for certain types of crimes. Uh, but uh, this makes it very clear that the NS department now has those powers for national security offenses. Uh, also, let me also say, I forgot to mention that where this refers to offenses endangering national security, 
I take the view that that refers to all uh, national security offenses, not only those in the NSL, so including possibly sedition or treason. And I think there's uh, references in the Jimmy Lai decision, CFA decision that supports that. Um, so we have the, the seven uh, um, clauses here. Um, and as I say, m many of these are taken from existing police powers. There are, of course, new powers relating to um, uh, uh, the internet and uh, taking down information and providing assistance about subscribers, etc. Uh, and that's that's clause four. Um, and then uh, there are, uh, I think, number five is also new about providing information about political uh, organizations plus their agents. Um, uh, now, uh, clause six, of course, is special in that uh, the uh, existing ordinance that uh, confers powers to intercept and, and uh, conduct surveillance uh, requires judicial authorization for uh, interception and type one surveillance. That is not required here. Only the chief executive's uh, approval is needed. Uh, so that, of course, is, is a difference from existing law. Uh, I've highlighted a few words in yellow and white because I think it's important that uh, these are important, what I would describe as minimum standards, uh, reasonable ground standard uh, is, is necessary, having evidence. Uh, there's not many here. I would argue that they're actually implicit minimum standards, uh, necessary safeguards for these powers to be uh, exercised. Uh, and um, I think many of those safeguards are in the implementation rules. Uh, so there will be uh, arguments that can be made about what are those minimum standards for exercising these powers, because they can't be just these bare requirements. If you just look at um, the first one, search of premises, vehicles, vessels, if you didn't have the implementation rules, um, this is unbounded, right? Uh, who's the issuing authority? Uh, is it a court? Uh, is it some senior police officer? What are the prerequisites, right? It's, Unbound. So there has to be something that is implicit in order for these uh, powers uh, to be law, um, to meet the principle of legal certainty, to meet Article 6 of the legislation, the law and legislation. Uh, so um, that uh, will give rise to, I think, some interesting arguments. But what are those uh, minimum standards implicit uh, in these powers? Um, now, let me deal with a, a more interesting, uh, another interesting question that when you look at these 116 pages of implementation rules, you'll come across criminal offenses. And uh, there are something like 17 criminal offenses. Uh, here's an example that we, under the Schedule 3 powers that pertain uh, to um, uh, not, uh, uh, sorry, but pertain to freezing uh, assets, etc. cetera. Um, if you contravene a freezing notice knowingly, that's punishable up to seven years imprisonment and unlimited fine. Uh, it's a very serious offense. In fact, so if the banks were to deal with that frozen money uh, uh, of uh, next media, they could be liable to this criminal offense. So the question is, is that criminal offense enforceable? Right? And the uh, common law lawyer would look at this and say, this is rather strange because if you look at the so-called empowering provision of Article 43, it doesn't say that the implementation rules can have criminal offenses. Uh, that's what we would normally look for in primary legislation and in the, in in the empowering ordinance. But I say that that's the wrong uh, paradigm uh, or the wrong framework to be looking at this law. Um, uh, the powers uh, are actually in Article 43. And I think the question then is, uh, do these powers uh, expressly or by necessary implication uh, confer authority uh, to have offenses uh, in the implementation rules. Um, and my view is gen generally speaking is, is yes, because if you look at those particular criminal offenses, firstly, they're not new, newly invented. They're actually based on criminal offenses that exist in the uh, powers already that we see in other ordinances. And, and the purpose really is to make these powers effective, right? To ensure people comply with these powers. So I think it's a good argument to say that they're necessarily incidental. Um, one interesting power uh, or an offense uh, is that relating to the duty to uh, report suspicious transactions, which comes under Schedule 3, uh, which is the third uh, clause. Um, it's the third clause, of course, says nothing about uh, people having to make suspicious transactions, uh, suspicious reports. 
right, reports of suspicious property. Um, it's, clause three, of course, is, is the so-called sort of proceeds of crime money laundering uh, clause, uh, but it doesn't refer specifically to putting a duty on everyone to report uh, uh, suspicious property, which is punishable by criminal offense. Uh, but uh, I would say it is arguable that it does implicitly uh, come within that clause uh, simply uh, because it, it is part of an overall scheme of um, uh, uh, monitoring uh, tainted property. Uh, and also it's part of a, a clause of restraining property. So there's a, a scheme whereby you can actually freeze property using the no consent letters. Uh, and uh, so that is part of uh, freezing, I think. Um, so uh, I would argue that it, it can come within that clause. Um, now, we, let me turn now to uh, accountability mechanisms. And uh, I think for the most part, um, uh, the existing accountability mechanisms uh, still exist. For example, judicial review, that it is built into many of the implementation rules already. In my paper, I, I have uh, uh, two tables where I set out um, all the different uh, uh, powers and who the issuing authority is. And then sometimes if, if the issuing authority is an executive uh, uh, officer, uh, there's still a procedure whereby you can apply to the court to review uh, what the officer has done. So you, you see that with the freezing power, the secretary for justice can freeze, but then you can apply to the CFI to challenge it. So there's judicial review is built in, but if it's not built in, uh, uh, my view is that you can still apply for judicial review, right? Because no, you're not reviewing anything that the committee has done. Yes, you cannot review uh, decisions of the committee, but you're not reviewing the decisions of the committee, you're reviewing the decisions of the executive officer uh, or, or, or police uh, uh, or, or the secretary. Uh, and that I think is still, uh, it's, you're still open to do that. What the grounds of review may be, of course, is debatable, um, but uh, there is still some possibility of review. Even we saw recently this uh, judicial review of the uh, secretary's decision not to have a jury trial, uh, the court says uh, uh, it's still possible to review it. The grounds are limited, uh, uh, but um, uh, you can't review it on the traditional uh, public uh, uh, public law grounds. But you can still uh, review it on uh, bad faith, uh, abuse, etc. It's much more limited. Um, now, exclusion of evidence, I think, is quite important here because uh, no doubt people will wonder. And this is uh, in a real case. What if the officers act contrary? to the, uh, the rules um, or uh, they fail to comply fully with the rules or the guidelines, um, you know, can I have the evidence that's been obtained excluded? Uh, and my view is that uh, there isn't uh, too much of a change from the existing law. Uh, but I do think it is important to distinguish between breaches of the rules alone, which don't amount to a breach of Article 43. So I don't think every breach of the IR, which could be very technical breaches, you know, you, you're maybe one hour out of the 48 hour uh, uh, requirement on emergency authorizations. It could be a very technical kind of a breach. I don't think that necessarily amounts to a breach of Article 43. So this is where that analysis about what are the minimum standards that are in Article 43. Um, if it's a breach of the minimum standard, whether it's explicit or implicit, then there's a breach of Article 43. And that I think has greater consequences. If it's just a breach of the IR and not the Article 43, then you apply the common law fair trial exclusion test. Right? More, is it more prejudicial than probative? Uh, does it violate the principle against self-incrimination? That's the Lam Tap Ming decision from 2000. Uh, uh, but if you can show that it has actually been unlawful, unlawfully obtained, then I think you can mount a stronger argument for exclusion based on the principles in uh, Muhammad Riaz Khan, uh, which identified uh, exclusion based on uh, breaches of the constitution. Now, uh, one may think, well, are you now reviewing for constitutionality? And I think that the answer is no. Um, and the, uh, the reply is this, that uh, if you have, if the officers have acted contrary to Article 43, that it could amount to an unlawful search, uh, an unlawful interference with privacy, Article 14 of the IC, uh, of the Bill, Hong Kong Bill of Rights. Um, and uh, then you're in the uh, arena of Mohammed Riaz Khan, 
which then says the court has a discretionary power to exclude, uh, not only on fair trial grounds, but also on the basis of whether it's reconcilable with rights and on the basis of whether the officers would continue to repeat what they're doing if they admit the evidence. So it's a wider basis for exclusion, what I call the integrity ground, uh, grounds. Um, and, um, uh, and I think the courts, I think courts can still do that because you're not reviewing Article 43 for compatibility. It's simply a case where the officers have acted contrary. These are Hong Kong officers, not mainland officers. Hong Kong officers have acted contrary to 43. Uh, and that has uh, uh, common law discretionary uh, exclusion implications. Um, uh, one thing I, I have in the paper that I don't have here is the power of staying a proceeding if there's an abusive process. That I don't see has changed at all. Uh, so there's a very well recognized uh, test uh, by the CFA, a Li Ming T decision, uh, goes back to 2001, which says that the courts can stay a proceeding if there's an abusive process, a fair trial is impossible, uh, or there's been such a uh, disregard of the law or rules uh, such that there's an affront to public conscience. Uh, and the courts have state proceedings where uh, ICC officers have deliberately violated legal professional privilege. That will still be there, in my view, uh, uh, to stay and to ensure there's accountability. Of course, you still have the capo and the disciplinary procedures. And interestingly, the guidelines even say that the officers who breach the guidelines may face prosecution for misconduct in public office. And that shouldn't just apply to interception and, and surveillance. It should apply, I think, to all breaches uh, of uh, the uh, rules, uh, potentially. Uh, you have to, of course, meet the requirements of that offense. What's different? So uh, firstly, there's no review, constitutional review, of Article 43 in the IR. We know that from Jimmy Lai. Um, and I would say, even if there was review, uh, I'm not sure you would find incompatibility uh, because uh, those who put together these IRs were very aware of the Hong Kong jurisprudence. Uh, and there have been many challenges already to the existing uh, police powers. Some have been found constitutional, some have not. And those who put those IRs together are quite aware of that, and they built in constitutionality in the IR to some extent. What's novel, of course, is the chief executive's power to order interception and surveillance. That's a likely target, but I'm not so sure that that, that might be incompatible. Uh, it's not like we were back in 2005 in the Leung Kwa Kong case, challenging the telecommunications chief governor, chief executive power to tap phones based simply on public interest with no legal framework at all. The executive order on covert surveillance was not law. Uh, IR coupled with Article 43 is law, and it's very detailed. There are a lot of you know, detailed preconditions, safeguards. Uh, yes, you don't have the high court judge as a commissioner, uh, which you do have under the interception ordinance, but um, you have, in theory anyways, the possibility of an independent person serving in that role. Um, and, and we don't know uh, how that's actually at this point in time. Uh, so I also think this may not be such a great thing if there was constitutional review. And I, I've said this before uh, in, a, in, a, in a comment that I wrote on the Jimmy Lai case, um, because in the Jimmy Lai case, we were dealing with the bail provision. I think if the court actually conducted proportionality analysis, there's a good chance they may have found it to be proportional that the reverse uh, onus in this particular context may have been justified. That might not have been good for rights generally, with a possible knock-on effect. Uh, and similarly here, if the court was to say chief executive can order uh, legitimately, proportionally, interception and surveillance in these types of cases, then that could be a very dangerous precedent, I think, because it may then open the door to then further exceptions uh, to the right. Uh, so uh, I'm not too bothered by the fact that you can't judicially review uh, uh, these powers. Um, now, another, of course, difference is because you don't have CAP 1's uh, special regime for journalistic materials, it doesn't apply. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've just been given the signal, so I'm gonna wrap up uh, very quickly. Uh, and it's all in the paper, uh, in the book chapter. Uh, I don't think it, uh, this is uh, too much of a problem because the courts can still take into account journalistic and, and the impact on freedom of expression. There's a, there's a great uh, Canadian case, an old Canadian case called uh, uh, Decoteau, 
uh, which refers to police officers. Um, you don't uh, walk into a lawyer's office or a church as if you're walking in a lion's den, right? Um, and that uh, you would have uh, special, more uh, greater precautions and safeguards uh, when you're going into these constitutionally protected uh, places. Uh, and the Hong Kong courts have recognized. That. So when you're searching law offices, there has to be additional requirements and conditions. Uh, and then finally, I'll just simply say that you have an additional oversight mechanism through the committee, uh, uh, which uh, I think uh, civil society individuals should fully make sure that they're exercising this uh, supervisory role. And, and hopefully that there could be some reporting uh, in LegCo uh, on, on, on these matters. Thank you very much. This is summer. Thank you, Simon. Um, uh, and we shift gears a little bit. Uh, and uh, the next uh, paper is actually co-written by uh, Professor Carol Peterson and uh, Professor Kelly Loper. Yeah, Kelly Loper is a, is a, is a colleague of uh, ours in, uh, in Hong Kong University. Unfortunately, she um, has an irreconcilable uh, uh, speaking uh, engagement. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Professor Peterson here yeah, is going to uh, uh, do the presentation uh, on their behalf. Yeah. Carol, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for organizing the conference and inviting us to submit this chapter. It's really wonderful to see colleagues again um, and to meet some new colleagues. I hope that in a year or so, we can all get together in person instead of over Zoom. Um, and I want to apologize last night, I, or yesterday, I had to leave after the first panel because I'm in East Coast time in the US this month. So I went to bed. So if I repeat something that was said in the second or third panels, I apologize. I'll try to listen to the recording when I can. Um, I liked what Simon said about constitutionally protected place. And I certainly hope that the government will think of university campuses as a constitutionally protected place rather than as a lion's den, but I'm not so sure. So our paper, our chapter on academic freedom has gone through a lot of revisions this spring. Uh, we had tried to take a reasonably optimistic approach. Um, events of the spring have made us a little more pessimistic, I have to say. However, our overall conclusion is still the same, which is that it's really important for university leaders to get out there and draft some policies on academic freedom. And so that is what I'll finish with, is some possible language for a policy on academic freedom. But first, I want to start by talking about the concept of academic freedom. Um, and there are many definitions of academic freedom out there. But the one that I like the best is the one from UNESCO, which describes it as the right without constriction by prescribed doctrine to freedom of teaching and discussion, freedom in carrying out research and disseminating and publishing the results thereof, freedom to express freely their opinion about the institution or in system in which they work, freedom from institutional censorship and freedom to participate in professional representative academic bodies. So if you break this down, there are really four special components. One is freedom in teaching. One is freedom to conduct research. The third is freedom of intramural expression, meaning the freedom to critique your own university and to take part in its governance. And that's one of the things that distinguishes an academic job from say being a lawyer for, for IBM. You do have the right to critique your own boss if you are an academic. And then freedom of extramural expression, meaning to share the research outcomes. Now there are of course many overlaps between uh, freedom of expression and other civil liberties, but academic freedom is not simply an individual right. And that's something that people sometimes forget. Academic freedom is a right that we enjoy, not because we're so special as people, but because academic freedom is essential to the university's public mission, which is the provision of quality education for our students, the pursuit of truth through our research and the production and dissemination of knowledge. So it's that public mission that we have to focus on when we try to defend and promote academic freedom. And as a side note, this is of course also true of a free press. It's not there just to protect individual journalists, it's there to serve a public purpose. Um, and it's because of this public purpose 
that I feel the academic community not only enjoys academic freedom, but we have a duty to defend it. And I also feel that that's a duty that university administrators share. And I feel the government has a duty to promote and protect academic freedom. And interestingly enough, even in these troubled times in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government has issued a number of statements, both locally and to international human rights treaty bodies, claiming that academic freedom is still cherished in Hong Kong and will be protected. And so I think it's incumbent upon university leaders and individual academics to come together and hold the government to those promises. Now, of course, academic freedom is not an absolute concept, and it also includes some duties as well as freedoms. You have a duty as an academic to be ethical in your research, to avoid conflicts of interest. You have a duty sometimes to, to bear in mind that you are not speaking for your university, but rather for yourself and your research. And sometimes that is a distinction that needs to be emphasized because otherwise the com community may not understand that. Um, I think it's also fair to acknowledge that academic freedom is threatened not only in authoritarian nations, but often in democratic nations. And if you read some of the reports that Scholars at Risk produces, you'll see that there are many threats to academic freedom that aren't necessarily even political in nature. Sometimes it's financial. Uh, there are a number of universities in the United States that no longer have academic tenure because they are, they don't feel they can they can support tenure with their reduced academic budgets. Cuts in public funding to education also make universities often very dependent on other sources of funding, such as private corporate donate donations, which can create bias for research. So there are lots of threats to academic freedom. Today, I'm going to, of course, focus on the national security law, but I think we have to acknowledge that there are many threats to academic freedom around the world. Next slide. Um, academic freedom began really as a tradition of universities, but it is now very firmly grounded in many constitutions, but also in international human rights law. And so there are a number of provisions in the ICCPR, which is of course incorporated into Hong Kong's basic law, uh, uh, it, it, Hong Kong's law through the Boro, the Bill of Rights Ordinance, and through Article 39 of the Basic Law. Um, but it's not just the ICCPR, it's also the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that's relevant here because of the right to education and the right to enjoy benefits of scientific progress. And the treaty monitoring body, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, has issued a general comment on the right to education, which has said very firmly that that right can only be enjoyed by the community if it's accompanied by academic freedom. Um, I have to tell you, the treaty monitoring bodies are very concerned by the national security law. Uh, last August, the UN Human Rights Committee issued its list of issues for the upcoming review of Hong Kong under the ICCPR, and it asked for information on reports that the national security law will interfere with academic freedom. Of course, that's not the only question the Human Rights Committee asked about the national security law, but it's the one I'm focusing on today. Um, the Hong Kong government said in reply that academic freedom is protected by the basic law and that we as a government attach great importance to upholding academic freedom and institutional autonomy. And the Hong Kong government issued a very similar statement locally in December 2020 when the government was asked to clarify statements about whether academic exchanges would continue to be allowed between Hong Kong and Taiwan. And they issued a quite strong statement uh, saying, yes, academic freedom continues in Hong Kong. Uh, more recently, the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights also requested information regarding academic freedom in its list of issues for the upcoming review of Hong Kong under ISCRA. Um, we're still, as far as I know, awaiting the Hong Kong government's replies, but I think that they will be very similar. The Hong Kong government will insist that academic freedom is still cherished, practiced, and protected in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is fortunate in that we have constitutional protection for academic freedom, and many constitutions do not expressly protect academic freedom, but the basic law does. In addition to the civil liberties that we all enjoy, freedom of 
of speech, publication. Article 34 expressly cites the freedom to engage academic research, literary and artistic creation. And Article 136 says Hong Kong government will formulate its education policies on its own. That's supposed to be a part of Hong Kong's autonomy. And Article 137 is perhaps the most important. And that's the one that the Hong Kong government often cites in its response to treaty monitoring bodies, saying that educational institutions retain their autonomy, enjoy academic freedom. Um, and you might say, well, why did we get so many provisions on academic freedom in the basic law? Well, it wasn't an accident. They come from the joint declaration. And the reason they were in the joint declaration is that there were many people in Hong Kong who cherished academic freedom and were concerned that after the handover, it might be under threat. And so these were specific promises that were made partly because I think both sides recognize the importance of maintaining the quality of Hong Kong's universities. And Hong Kong for a very tiny jurisdiction does very well in the international university rankings. We have a number of universities ranked in the top 100, I think five the last time I checked. And that's really impressive for such a small territory. And one of the reasons that Hong Kong has these highly ranked universities is because the international community recognizes that academic freedom has been protected here. But as I mentioned before, legal protections aren't necessarily enough. You need good funding, you need institutional autonomy, you need tenure, you need strong university policies. Um, and you also need a commitment that the university will stand by academics who follow their policies. And that's one reason we're gonna suggest uh, at the very last slide, some language for a policy. Now, I just briefly, we do discuss briefly in our chapter, the Robert Chung affair. It was a long time ago, and it seems like a very quaint time now, looking back on it. Um, but some of you will remember when Robert Chung complained that the Hong Kong News vice chancellor had pressured him to stop a research project that was embarrassing to Tung Shi Wa. Um, eventually, the vice chancellor resigned, but it was only after an independent investigation panel held hearings, which were televised, um, and those hearings confirmed the allegations. Its report confirmed the allegations. And more than one half of HKU's academic staff signed a petition asking the Hong Kong U Council to accept the panel's report. Why did we feel that we had to sign that petition? Because we were worried that even though Hong Kong U Council was the one that had set up the panel and empowered it, we were worried that they might not do anything about it because the chairman, T.L. Yang, was in a really difficult position. He was also a member of Tung Shi Wa's executive council. And so when Jan Curry and Kaho Mak and I wrote our book on academic freedom in 2006, we devoted a whole chapter to the Robert Chung affair, partly because we wanted to show that it, although it looked like a victory for the academic freedom, it actually showed how vulnerable the universities were because there was not enough separation between the local government and the university councils. Unfortunately, after 2006, Hong Kong actually went in the opposite direction. Instead of separating the universities and giving them greater autonomy from the government in its governance structure, we started seeing the university councils become less representative of academics and more dominated by appointed external members. To be honest, if the current Hong Kong U Council received a complaint from someone like Robert Chung, I'm not sure that they would handle it in the same way. Um, we also saw the abolition of elected deans. I know that that was a direct result of the Sutherland report. The idea behind getting rid of elected deans was to make the universities leaner, stronger fighting machines, more, more competitive in the international education market. But it has, it has problems for academic freedom, particularly when you are a tiny jurisdiction with mainland China just north of the border. And so in an article we published in 2008, we also said we did not support these changes and we thought that Hong Kong was going in the wrong direction. Now, these changes to governance and this lack of institutional protection for academic freedom has really come to haunt Hong Kong, in my opinion now, because now we're in a situation where of course the Hong Kong government looks at the university campuses as threats. Um, the government clearly blames academics and students for Occupy Central, for the earlier opposition to the national education proposals. So even before the national security law, academics were reporting increased interference. Um, in an article that I published in 2017, 
I reported on many interviews and a whole lot of academics told me, usually off the record, most of them didn't want their names used, but a lot of them said, I'm just keeping my head down. We feel that there is retribution for Occupy Central and it's being aimed especially at Hong Kong U. Um, Now, of course, with the national security law, the Hong Kong government arguably has a mandate to interfere more in the educational sector, and they're certainly doing it, particularly in the primary and secondary schools, but I think we're going to see more of it at tertiary level as well. So you have Articles 9 and 10 that clearly direct the the government to get involved, Um, and yet we still see the government saying academic freedom was cherished and will be protected. So in my opinion, we have a little bit of a clash right now. We have on one hand, the government insisting that academic freedom continues, but on the other hand, you see increased encroachments. And you also see, I think a lot of university administrators kind of cooperating with that, cutting ties with student unions, calling the police when students are marching around campus. It seems to me that many university administrators are very nervous and I think they should be drafting policies to clarify the scope of academic freedom and to be assertive about it. But I worry, perhaps they've been told not to do so, because unless I, I have heard reports that policies have been drafted, circulated, talked about, but I don't see anything on any university websites yet. And that concerns me. Now, Is there any good news? Yes. (laughs) The good news, which many people will be referring to in their chapters is of course, Article 4 and Article 5 of the National Security Law. Um, Pleased to see that it's there. Uh, I'm pleased to see that the two main human rights treaties are referred to there and also that the Court of Final Appeals said in the Jimmy Lai case that these articles are centrally important to the interpretation of the national security law. They provide the context in which the national security law must be construed and applied. So if this principle is applied not just to Article 42, but to all the vague language in the national security law, then it may be possible to for the courts to adopt interpretations that comply with the ICCPR and ISCRA. Um, Of course, we know, though, that Article 62 says that the national security law prevails over inconsistent local law. And so if there's any express provisions, they will likely be enforced, even if they do conflict with the ICCPR. Now, the next few slides consider how these issues might play out in terms of the specific offenses. So Articles 20 and 21 deal with secession. And we all know that Hong Kong has lots of territory, China has many territorial disputes, issues with respect to the border with India, the South China Sea, issues with Tibet. And so there's academic research out there about it. Now, in my opinion, there is no way that simply publishing an article should fall within Article 20, because I don't see it as organizing, planning, committing, or participating in any of the acts that are listed there. It's a little more concerning, though, when one looks at the scope of Article 21, because what happens if a student learns about the right to self-determination, for example, in a class or from an academics article, and then starts advocating for a right to self-determination for Hong Kong? Is that arguably within the scope of Article 21? In my opinion, not if we interpret vague language to comply with the applicable human rights treaties, but it would be nice to have some clarification on that. Um, Of course, the European Court of Human Rights has repeatedly confirmed that peaceful advocacy for constitutional change should not be considered a threat to national security. But I think that train has left the station in Hong Kong because we are seeing people being arrested simply for displaying a banner, uh, which in most countries would certainly not be considered an act of secession, but apparently it, it could lead to an arrest for inciting secession in Hong Kong now. Um, Article 22, subversion. When I first read the national security law, I thought this isn't something that academics should have to worry about because it's narrower. It has this additional requirement that you must have participated in the prohibited act by force or threat of force or other unlawful means. But then, of course, we saw the arrests of the pan-democrats for their unofficial primary. I think a lot of commentators, including myself, were wondering what, how, what's the unlawful means in, an, in a primary. And yet they're arrested and a whole lot of them are sitting in jail without any bail. 
Um, so that makes me concerned. I'm also very concerned by the fact that the new head of the Hong Kong police wants a law prohibiting fake news, which he blames for the police's poor image. Well, is, is it possible that the fake news law could be used as the basis for an unlawful means? Um, allegation, uh, what happens if academic research, which is often critical of government policies, is relied upon by an NGO who wants to delay or disrupt the Hong Kong government from implementing one of its policies? So I started out in January not feeling so concerned about subversion for the purposes of academic freedom, but now I'm concerned again. Uh, Foreign collusion is probably the worst one, um, I think, for academics, because we all know that academic research is often critical and it's often relied upon to pr pressure the Hong Kong government to change its policies. We also know that it's very common for Hong Kong academics to collaborate with foreign researchers. Indeed, the UGC encourages international collaboration. But unless academics are reassured that Article 29 will not be interpreted over broadly, these cross-border research activities may be impaired. And of course, even international conferences, once they are truly in-person conferences again, could be impaired because foreign academics are going to want to know whether there's any chance that critical research could fall within the scope of Article 29. Um, and of course, the extraterritorial provisions add to that concern. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this slide because uh, I know I'm running a little short on time here, but I just think we have to remember the public purpose of academic freedom. It's really so the, the community can benefit from the dispersal of research and information and education. And unfortunately, an unelected government has a strong incentive to try to curtail critical commentary, whether it comes from academics or journalists. And one of the best examples of this is in September 2020, when Carrie Lam reacted very strongly to academics who critiqued the Hong Kong government's testing scheme. She didn't just disagree with them. She attacked their motivations. She accused them of trying to smear the central government, of trying to sever Hong Kong's relations with the central government. And I really found her language very provocative, especially so soon after the enactment of the national security law. So I, I really think that we have to try to clarify things and try to get the government to acknowledge that some of its statements are not really consistent with its overall promise to protect academic freedoms. Because if academics stop critiquing government policies and actions, and I think that's already happening, then it's not just the individual academics who suffer, the community suffers because it loses access to research and academic expertise. So finally, um, I've got two more slides. And at the end of the chapter that Kelly and I wrote, we decided to try to draft an academic freedom policy because many people were asking us from various universities in Hong Kong for a model policy. And everything that I looked at the United States wasn't really appropriate because of course it doesn't have this kind of law to deal with. So in the chapter, we have the full, uh, it's about a page. Here I just summarized it. The first paragraph just defines academic freedom. The second summarizes the legal framework uh, for protecting academic freedom, but also articles four and five of the national security law. And paragraph three quotes the Hong Kong government's December 2020 statement affirming its commitment to academic freedom, because I think that's important. And I think every university should have that on their website. And then paragraphs four and five I've put out um, in full. And I'm happy to put them out again later if anyone wants these slides. But essentially, it tries to balance the freedoms that academics enjoy with the duties, which we also bear. A duty, for example, a commitment to accuracy and integrity, for example. Um, so it's important that we exercise the freedoms that come with academic freedom responsibly. And we tried to address that in paragraph four. Um, and then in paragraph five, also added to this, you know, the concept of exercising appropriate restraint. And I think especially in the context of Hong Kong, that is important now. Um, students in particular are very impressionable. And I don't think that final lobe in the brain develops until they're about 26. And sometimes they may be braver than they really should be. And so I think as academics, we do have to be careful that we don't encourage students to cross really clear red lines 
uh, because that could be the end of their freedom. But on the other hand, we have to we have to be willing to take some risks ourselves in exploring controversial topics, because if we just sit back and say, we can't talk about anything, we can't answer any of your questions, well, then we're really not filling, fulfilling our educational mission. So this is the language that we came up with. Of course, it's just a draft, and I realize different universities may have different approaches. But the key thing, and this is what I wanna finish with in my final slide, I promise, is that every university does need a robust policy affirming academic freedom. And the university has to think through the policy. I think the university should give the policy to the Hong Kong government and say, this is our policy. We will defend academics who follow this policy. And if you have any problems with it, you should say so now. Because one of the things that is the worst about the current situation, in my opinion, is that a lot of academics are operating in, under a cloud of uncertainty as to what they can say and what they cannot say. And some people are more comfortable and more brave than others, but I know some people are really very, very nervous. So I think these policies have to be pursued. I realize that some university administrators may think it's better just to kind of stay quiet, stay under the radar screen. We don't want to draw a lot of attention to ourselves. Lord knows there was perhaps too much attention on the university campuses in 2019. I realize that. But on the other hand, if you just stay quiet and do nothing and don't take the initiative, you know, it might get done for you in a way that you don't like. And that's kind of what happened with Article 23, the basic law, in my opinion. So I really think it's important that academics, not just individual academics, but also university leaders sit up and take responsibility for figuring out how you can practice academic freedom, even in the shadow of the national security law. And once you have this policy, there should be training for academic freedom, and there should be at least two tenured members of every department to receive complaints. That's very important because I think a lot of universities do not have an adequate complaints process. And if you have trouble lobbying for this, one of the things to remind university, university leaders of is that academic freedom does affect rankings. I know it's sometimes not explicit, but over time, Hong Kong universities will suffer if they don't strongly protect academic freedom. A lot of people who are there now, I know you're sticking it out and, and more credit to you for doing so, but it's gonna be much harder to recruit young academics if they feel that they will not be able to practice academic freedom. It will also be harder to recruit excellent university students. So I do hope that this, reminding people of this, and I've cited an article at the end that talks about the relationship between academic freedom and world-class universities. And my hope is that this might help individual academics to persuade their university leaders that you really need to draft assertive policies. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing, but I'm happy to put that policy up again later if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Carol. Uh, once again, um, uh, if you have any questions, um, please, uh, write them into the Q&A uh, uh, part of the, the, the Zoom screen. Yeah. And uh, now I will invite um, uh, Professor Albert Chen. Albert, are you ready? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, to, to deliver his uh, response to the three papers, yes. Albert. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, all three papers presented this morning are extremely useful in um, helping us understand uh, the uh, NSL and its implications. So I'll, I'll speak briefly on each paper. Um, first paper by, by uh, Professor Zai and Professor Fu um, introduced the, the background to the making of the NSL, um, including the central government's concern uh, that uh, a color revolution was in the making in Hong Kong. Um, and in fact, the word color revolution uh, appeared in some official uh, statements, and I think it is important to understand that uh, to understand the concept of color revolution as used by the central authorities. Um, then the central authorities emphasized that they they wanted to use legal means to deal with the the situation in Hong Kong. Uh, I know that in a paper the term legislative suppression was used to described in NSL, um, maybe the, the authors can also explain uh, the central government's thinking about using law to deal with uh, Hong Kong's problems. 
the decision to make the NSL was uh, was made uh, as pointed out in the paper in October 2019 uh, at the uh, fourth plenum of the uh, of the 19th Central Committee of the CCP. Uh, this was a very important uh, meeting, uh, a very important decision was made, uh, although we only know this subsequently uh, when the NSL was promulgated. But um, it is interesting to note that the central government has already made plans to, to restore uh, law and order in Hong Kong in the midst of the, uh, of the uh, uh, civil unrest, uh, which continued beyond October 2019. Uh, I believe that even the decision to, to reform Hong Kong's political system was probably made also at, at that uh, meeting because Chinese officials recently have said that the NSL and the electoral reform uh, were part of a single package uh, to, uh, to deal with the Hong Kong situation. Uh, the paper is very useful, I think, in um, introducing um, some concepts which are not well known uh, in Hong Kong, such as high policing, political policing, uh, oppositional uh, political crimes, uh, the, uh, the distinction between enemy criminal law and citizen criminal law, and what the authors call the poli sorry, policification of the criminal law, which they refer by which they mean the, 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 the shift from a court-centered system to a police-centered system. Uh, the paper is also very, uh, uh, very uh, useful in pointing out how, how the NSL uh, has led to an, an increased involvement of the central authorities uh, in the governance of Hong Kong. Uh, um, the concept of prerogative state was also used in the paper, although not in the oral presentation. It seems to suggest that the NSL um, created a, a, a separate um, uh, kind of legal system uh, existing side by side with uh, the so-called normal or ordinary legal system. Uh, I think prerogative state is based on the idea of the dual state uh, uh, developed by, by German thinkers. Um, now, um, the, the paper concludes by saying that, well, uh, the, uh, the Hong Kong system, even after the NSL, is not the same as the mainland system in which they practice uh, what the authors called total policing uh, with a comprehensive national security infrastructure in the mainland, and we in Hong Kong, we don't have such uh, a comprehensive in infrastructure. Uh, I, I think the authors correctly pointed out that um, uh, they, the central authorities do not want to turn Hong Kong into just another mainland city. Uh, they, they are still committed to one country, two systems as correctly implemented uh, in their view. And there, there's, there will still be a significant difference between uh, the two systems and the one country. Two systems, and there will be still be space for for um, the media and civil society and and, and for religion uh, in Hong Kong, and also for academic research, which is also mentioned in the paper. Now I turn to the uh, the paper by Simon. Um, um, I, I will focus on one point uh, on which I have some doubt. Uh, maybe we can explore that uh, further. Uh, but on other points, I, I agree with Simon, uh, for example, his analysis of the relationship between the, uh, the National Security Committee and the um, National Security Department uh, of the police. And uh, I also agree that uh, the powers of the police under Article 43 are not confined to offenses under the NSL, but uh, but extend to other offenses endangering national security, uh, which is the concept of offenses endangering national security not being limited to the um, NSL offenses uh, uh, can, can be found um, in various provisions of the NSL and also in various official statements. 
uh, including this, the, the, the CFA decision in, uh, on the Lai Chi Ying case. Now, I want to focus on the, the main point on which I want to explore further with Simon, and that is the point about, um, about uh, Article 43 and uh, the implementing rules uh, and, and, and the legal status or nature of the implementing rules. Now, it is clear that uh, as NSL is not an ordinance, uh, so, so, the sub, so the concept of subsidiary legislation and the rules governing subsidiary legislation um, in Hong Kong are not applicable to the implementing rules. Um, but I think that it can still be argued that the implementing rules um, are in the nature of subsidiary legislation uh, under the Chinese legal system. Uh, so, so even though it is not the making of, the, of these rules are not authorized by an ordinance. It is authorized by a, a national law. And so rules made in accordance with the national law as authorized by the national law uh, actually have the same, uh, same nature of subsidiary legislation, uh, the making of which is authorized by an ordinance. So if you look at the, the text of Article 43, the last paragraph, uh, I read it in Cantonese. Um, 授權香港特別行政區行政長官會同香港特別行政區維護國家安全委員會為採取本條第一款規定措施制定相關實施細則。So and the English translation is largely accurate, um, which says that uh, the uh, the CE and the Committee on National Security are authorized to make relevant implementing rules. So since in the Chinese word is saukun, so it seems that the NPCSC has delegated part of its lawmaking power to the, uh, to the uh, CE uh, together with the uh, NS committee. It's just the same as legislative council passing an ordinance, delegating part of its legislative power to, to say a government uh, official or, or some other body to meet subsidiary legislation. So I think it is arguable that this, the, the, the implementing rules, um, which the making of which is authorized by the, by the NSL uh, has the force of law in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, also um, it is arguable that the doctrine of ultravirus, which is usually applied to subsidiary legislation, which can be challenged on the ground that uh, it is ultra-virus, the principal ordinance. Uh, it, may, it is arguable that doctrine ultra-virus can, can be applied by the courts in reviewing whether a particular um, uh, provision in the implementing rules falls within the, the, the authorization uh, in the last paragraph of Article 43. I, I agree with Simon that these implementing rules are not subject to constitutional review in so far as they are consistent with an uh, intra-virus Article 43, because Article 43 itself is not subject to constitutional review. The whole of the NSL is not subject to, the con uh, to constitutional review. So, uh, so that is uh, uh, a, a main point I would like to make. And also the, I agree with Simon that the, the offenses created by the implementing rules are validly created. But this also reinforces the view that the, the implementing rules have the force of law. Uh, if they do not have the force of law, then the offenses which they created uh, may not have the force of law too. Uh, too. Um, I think Simon has usefully pointed out that the, 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 the implementing rules are actually modeled on existing Hong Kong ordinances. So, so what, 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 what is done is that some of the powers which the Hong Kong police has under the existing law um, uh, in relation to certain types of offenses, uh, such as syndicate, syndicated crimes and so on, are now extended to the to the national security offenses. Although there's some extension which, which, which is new, uh, for example, the, the covert surveillance powers and, and so on. 
Uh, okay, um, I, I will not comment further on the details about the, uh, the, 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 the degree to which the supervision, uh, the supervision of the uh, central the CPG office uh, for national security in Hong Kong. But, but I agree with Simon that the courts uh, do have a role to play in determining, for example, whether uh, the act of a particular official in that office um, is done in the course of uh, execution of duties. Okay, um, now I turn to the last paper. Uh, I'm, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to see Carol. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I find that uh, Ka Ka Carol and Kelly's paper are very useful. Uh, actually, we, we underwent a faculty review um, just last, in the last few days and the reviewers <laughs> uh, did express concern about uh, academic freedom and believe that this is a very important uh, uh, issue which the university has to tackle um, if uh, the future of the faculty is to be secured. Uh, the paper provides very useful uh, discussion of the concept of academic freedom and its relationship with human rights, and also the um, basic law um, provisions uh, uh, on academic freedom. Uh, Carol said uh, in your presentation just now that these provisions were derived from the Joint Declaration. Uh, and I just had a look at the relevant provisions in the Joint Declaration, which is mainly, uh, which is mainly um, sections 10 and 13 of NS1 to the Joint Declaration. Uh, and it seems that the Joint Declaration and the NS does not actually use the word academic freedom. There is a reference to freedom of academic research um, and also reference to uh, the autonomy of educational institutions. Um, these two provisions are also in the, in the basic law, but the provision in the basic law on specifically um, mentioning academic freedom is in fact new. That is, it's not in the joint declaration. It was inserted because of the concerns uh, expressed uh, in Hong Kong in the 1980s during the process of drafting of the basic law uh, concerns about academic freedom. And that's why you, you have the express mention of the word academic freedom in Article 137 uh, of the basic law. Um, these provisions, uh, including the express mention of academic freedom, are of course very useful in, for the future uh, because as, as the paper suggests, uh, uh, they, they are advocating that the, the NSL should be interpreted in such a way to protect academic freedom. So the courts can rely on these provisions on academic freedom uh, in the basic law uh, in the future uh, in interpreting the NSL. Um, finally, I think the paper provides very useful over, a review of relevant developments in Hong Kong relating to academic freedom, uh, including the Robert Chong incident. There's also another incident, um, which I think Carol didn't mention in the presentation, but it's mentioned in the paper concerning alleged interference uh, with uh, the Hong Kong Institute of Education, as it was called at that time. Uh, and it led to a, a judicial review a case being brought before the court. So, uh, so I think that case, uh, and that incident also contributes to the, the Hong Kong jurisprudence and experience on, on academic uh, freedom. So I think uh, I've taken up 15 minutes. So, so that, that's exactly the, um, the amount of time uh, I'm allocated. So thank you. Thank you, Albert. Uh